Hi, everybody. So I can't emphasize enough how, how important it is uh, to choose the right co-founder when uh, creating the culture that you want to build at your company. How many of you in this room, first of all, are planning to, to start a company? OK, so almost everybody. How many of you are thinking that you want to go it alone? That's good. So almost everybody here is going to start a company, and almost all of you are going to choose a co-founder. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about today is some best practices <coughs> and, and how to think about choosing your co-founder. And then secondly, um, once you choose your co-founder, how you maintain a really healthy re relationship with that person for the long haul. Uh, so a little bit about my background, uh, I, I ran a couple of startups straight out of undergrad myself. Uh, one was a, a clothing company and the second was an e-commerce company. This was all back in the 90s. We called them click and mortar. Back then, no one thought that standalone uh, e-commerce would ever be feasible back then. So you had to have re a retail component with actual stores. So that was my, uh, that was my uh, first couple of forays into startup land. After that, I, I, I had a small exit, and then I chose to go back to get my graduate uh, degree in counseling psychology, after which point I became a marriage counselor. You might be wondering, that's kind of an odd pivot. Why did you become a marriage counselor? <laughs> uh, it's a great question. Uh, but how, what I will say is that when I ran my first couple of startups, uh, there was, aside from the business uh, part of what we were doing, I ran into all kinds of, of psychological challenges just managing my team and, and, and interacting with my own co-founder. It was, it was so intense that by the time I sold my second company, I decided that I wanted to pivot and dive into the world of psychology and to learn more of the source code behind what was causing me all the stress and conflict in my last two companies. So after, uh, after I had, uh, I, I built up a, a couple of psychology clinics in San Francisco called Well Clinic, and then I had this insight that there was, what happened was I started having all of these uh, co-founders coming in to my practice who were having conflict. And because I had a business background, and I also had a, a clinical psychology degree. People thought, wow, this is the guy who's going to help us solve our problems. It was completely organic demand. But I saw that there was an opportunity here. Wow, there are people who, who, people who are running a business together face the same kinds of challenges that married couples face. It was astonishing to me, but so incredibly true. So what we're going to cover today is why even have a co-founder in the first place, right? If it's so damn hard, why would you want one? Why just not have one? That solves that problem, right? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Two, uh, how to choose the right co-founder, okay? Uh, three, some uh, best practices for ma maintaining the relationships, and then lastly, we'll get into, into questions. So, uh, my, my slide was given away a little bit by the, by the intro, but tell me a little bit uh, why, why startups fail, y'all. Anyone? Why do startups fail? Resources and people. Okay, lack of resources. And what? And? and people. People and what? The founders, no. No well Okay. Founder conflict. What else? Why do startups fail? Culture. Culture. What about culture? Poor culture. Poor culture. Okay. Anyone else? Why do startups fail? Pardon me? La bad communication. Yes. Lack of motivation. Lack of motivation. Yes, that is more common when a company starts to fail. You'll see motivation decline. People tend to be very excited and really motivated when things are moving up and to the right. But then most, as, soon as, as soon as the company starts to have trouble, then you'll see disengagement and motivation start to decline. A need for accountability. A, need, a lack of accountability, absolutely. That's a great one. The other one is market changes, right? It's another really important practical reason why startups fail, is, is changes uh, in the market or miscalculation in the size of the market. However, 
You are right. About so about 65% of startups fail because of people problems, and we know this because of uh, longitudinal studies conducted out of HBS, where they studied large cohorts of startups and they measured why it was that these start people were failing, and what they found was that 65% were failing because of internal people problems more than strategic strategic problems. <coughs> There's a great book for all, all of you should read it by Noam Wasserman called The Founder's Dilemma. And there's a lot of really great case studies uh, uh, around why startups fail, and this is uh, front and center. So definitely read that book before you start your, your company. 80% of startups fail before ever raising your A. So think about that. Of everyone in this room, your first company, 80% of, of your companies are going to fail before you ever raise a Series A. Why is that? Anyone? Because it's really hard. It is really, really hard to do. It's fairly easy-ish to raise a seed round. It's very difficult to raise a Series A. And primary, the uh, one uh, main reason for that, in my opinion, is that to raise a seed round, you get to really raise on enthusiasm and vision. But by the time it comes down to raising $10 million on Sand Hill Road, you've got to have data. You've got to have metrics that prove that your market is big enough and that your demand is big enough. That's a big reason why most startups fail before they ever raise an A, is because they just didn't get the traction and they failed before that. So here's a couple really important points for why you want a co-founder. You want a co-founder because it's at co P, uh, companies with co-founders see more investment than singleton founders. At, at YC, uh, for a long time, they didn't even take singleton founders. It was very, very, it was very rare. Uh, Parker Conrad from Zenefits, he was like one of the early kind of singleton founders. There were, have not been very many. There's more. Uh, recently, but it's still much harder to get into YC as a singleton founder than as than uh, if, uh, if you come as a co-founder pair or trio. Another one is is that there's a tremendous amount of workload, especially to get from that seed stage to Series A. There is so much work to do. It is incredibly challenging. You have to build a product. You have to then bring that product to market. You then have to deal with organizational and cultural challenges. All of that with just the two or the three of you, and maybe a couple people that you've hired, right? So shared workload, and and, and when you and when you share those uh, that workload, you want to have diversity uh, between between your skill sets because uh, you you don't want to have your co-founder. I'm going to get into this a little bit more later. But uh, you want a more technical co-founder who can handle handle the engineering or the science, and you want to, and then another co-founder who can handle more of the business, so you can spread the load. But then, lastly, this one seems um, odd, and why I have this up here, you're going to need someone to talk to, because starting a co starting a a, a a startup from scratch, you kind of feel like you're going crazy every day. And the reason is because you have this idea. You, you guys are going to come out of school, and a lot of your a lot of your classmates are going to are going to take jobs at Google. They're going to take jobs at McKinsey, BCG, Uber, all these awesome places to work. Okay, you are then going to take your idea and find your co-founder. You're going to say no to all these awesome opportunities, and you're going to go and try to start your company. Okay. There's going to be a period of time where you think you're going nuts. Wow, I turned down this job at, at McKinsey. Wow, I turned down this job at Google because I want to start this startup. You're going to have no customers. You're going to have no product. You're going to have no technology. All you're going to have is a couple of laptops and you and your co-founder hacking away on your keyboard. You need someone to talk to. You need someone to bounce your ideas off of. You need someone to say, man, is this a good idea? I, th I, I think this is a great opportunity, or we need to go and talk to this person. It's very, very important early on to have that mirroring that you'll have with your co-founder to keep you from going nuts. So that's another important one. 
uh, that you won't see, uh, you won't hear about in most places. But trust me, that's a very important one. So, a couple. I, I'd love to hear uh, thoughts. Any of you actually have co-founders now? A couple. How did you choose your co-founder? Um, we worked together on a like in a company before. Okay. And that one failed. So. Okay, but you work together. Yeah. And and are your skill sets symmetrical or complementary? Yeah, he's technical and I'm his business. And Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? How are you thinking about choosing your co-founder? Thoughts, ideas. So like we have. Like we have to have different talent for sure. Like we can like just share the same idea all the time. So like there has to be one people that always come up with different ideas and yep. different comments to leave, like to bring the whole conversation to another direction. Yep. That's a good one too. Anyone else? Um, I think my two filters are first we have to agree value wise. We don't have the same values as our network. Um, and then someone who is like where my weaknesses are, they're strong. So I'm like, I deal with the people, that's most of my strong suit. I need somebody to operation to found them. Perfect. That's exactly right. So you want symmetrical values and you want complementary skill sets. So your values, you want to have the same values. Like uh, uh, values, you're going to think about um, the kind of impact we want to have in the world, um, how we treat other people. Do we want to prize what kind of culture that we that we we believe in? Um, for some people, it may be like religious or political values. It's best to have those things be all uh, very symmetrical in your co-founder relationship. Very similar to a marriage, in my opinion. Uh, uh, symmetrical values are really important. Complementary skills means we have divergent skill sets. So my co-founder for my company. He, uh, Mike is a, is a data scientist, right? I can barely add two numbers together. So I needed somebody who could do math. So I recruited my one of, uh, an old friend of mine who had just graduated from Northwestern, a PhD program. He's, he's a statistician uh, with a clinical psych background. This is a perfect co-founder for me. And then I, then I focus on all of the outreach, the PR, the sales, and the go-to-market strategy. So for me, I knew because I'd gone to, co to grad school with him that we shared the same value sets, but then we we're very opposite when it came to skill sets. I needed somebody who had a science background and, and who was technical for what we were going to build together. Where do you find a co-founder? Where do you look? It's actually really hard. So, would you go to your family? <laughs> Anyone thought about hiring someone in their own family to be their co-founder? Would you would you make would you hire your best friend to be your co-founder? Super close friend, known him for 15 years, right? Is that maybe sometimes it's the best way then to start? Really common. It's super common. I've seen. I used to coach husband and wife teams all the time, who had started the companies together. It's a terrible. It's a terrible idea. Do not start a company with your spouse. So you think you're having? You have conflict right now. You have a lot more things to fight about. So, this is a. This is an interesting kind of nuanced answer that I have for this is when you find your co-founder, you ideally want someone that you've worked with before, but, and you want, you want to kind of have a bit of a friendship with that person. You need to like that person, but you don't want to be too close. And there's a couple reasons for it. Uh, one is that a lot of co-founder relationships fall apart. So if your company falls apart, your, your co-founder relationship will likely fall apart too. If that person also happens to be best friend, you've now just lost your co-founder and your best friend. And if you're married to that person, you've also lost, you've lost your spouse. If that happens to be a member of your family, again, I know, I, I, it sounds crazy, but people do this all the time. 
If that person happens to be your brother, well, what if you end up having to fire your brother? Think about how Thanksgiving dinner is going to feel next year. Right? So these are reasons to think very hard around co-founding a company with either a spouse or a family member. So look for someone. Think about someone you've worked together on a project before. They've been someone you've taken classes with. You've built an app with them. Um, you went on a year-long trip with them, but you kind of lost touch. Uh, my co-founder and I went to graduate, graduate school together. We were in a clinical practicum together, and we participated in this communications lab called T Group. Uh, but we worked together in a professional setting for about a year. So I was like, this is my guy. OK, so now we're going to uh, shift gears into uh, talking a little bit about best practices. So once you've made your choice of who your co-founder is going to be, now we have to keep the relationship healthy so that your company doesn't fall apart. The first important uh, thing to talk about is equity. Uh, I'd love to hear anybody's thoughts on equity uh, and titles and, and how you would think about splitting your equity up or questions about that. Should you split your should you split evenly your equity or should it not be split e equally? Not split equally? Okay. Anyone else? No. Not split equally? So if it's equally. Equally. So if it's not split equally, how are you making the determination how the split goes? So it's like, it depends on what kind of company that you're in. Suppose like you're in a skill, skills based company, such as like tech company, mm -hmm. like the skills part or tech part must have the higher, higher split of the equity. Yep, okay. So and maybe the more technical elevate. people could, should get more equity? Yes. Yeah, okay. I disagree with that one. I think skills are easily more easily interchangeable than having the network and social skills and the drive to, to work as a company. Okay, so network and drive, social skills, like leadership skills, those would be just as important as technical, maybe? It was. I see this a lot. It's my idea, I should get more. Uh, I really think that matters. Um, because the idea can't be actualized without the team, without the people. I think all of this kind of ties back into culture. If it's an even split and everybody has a feeling of ownership, the work's probably going to get done better. Ideas are cheap, people. Execution is not. So my co-founder and I decided to split equally. And the reason why we did that, uh, he's the more technical co-founder. It was my idea. I didn't attribute any extra value to the fact that it was all my idea because ideas are cheap, execution is not. So we decided to split 50-50, uh, and we just raised our A a couple weeks ago. And I'm really glad, that in, in retrospect, that we did keep it all 50-50. What I will say, uh, what I will say is that Here's a really interesting one. Um, Paul Graham, when asked, when asked why, how many co-founders is the right number of uh, co-founders, uh, there's a great uh, Paul Graham quote, the uh, co-founder of YC. He said, you want enough co-founders to help you get through the seed stage and get to your Series A, but if you now have so many people in your startup on your co-founding team that it starts to look like a group photo, you've probably got too many co-founders, okay? So we're, I only have one co-founder. We then hired a CTO. Uh, we then hired a CTO, a non-co-founder CTO later. The next person, your first hire is going to have precipitously less equity than, than the co-founder team. Much less equity, right? So 50-50, uh, if you have two co-founders all of a sudden, and then imagine three, four co-founders, your group photo situation. What happens then you raise your Series A, your Series A, the founders only retain 50% typically equity after your Series A, and then it only gets worse after you raise B and C rounds. So your dilution is going to be so severe after, after you raise your follow-on rounds that, you're, that you, you then won't have a motivated enough team. People start to leave, 
they don't feel incentivized enough to stick around. This is something we did early on, establish a social contract. This is a non-binding, something that no one else sees besides me and my co-founder, but we've, we've built a contract for thing, agreements that we would have together that we can refer back to and edit and change over time. Things like how we're going to make decisions, cultural values, work-life balance, the style of communication that we want to have together, uh, public relations and press, that's an interesting one. I'm the, I'm the CEO, so typically reporters always want to talk to the CEO, but the problem for the non-CEO co-founder is that person then doesn't get the limelight in the press, right? So if you have a co-founder who really is professionally ambitious just as much as the CEO, you'll have to have some agreement over how, around how you're going to share the limelight on, on a public stage, right? Uh, exit planning, um, how you're going to how you're going to spend money, your your values around diversity and inclusion, for example. Um, these are all important things that we have in our social contract together. Again, it's a non-binding thing that we just agree to. A couple of other practices. So, uh, you know, we're also you know we come from clinical psych backgrounds, so we go to co-founder therapy on a regular cadence. We also work with executive, we've historically worked with executive coaches. Right now we're actually working with a therapist. It may seem kind of strange. Why would I go to a therapist with my, with my co-founder? Uh, it's extremely common as someone who was a co-founder therapist before I came a co-founder coach. It's extremely common. People don't talk about it so much, but trust me, it's happening. And the reason is because there's so much conflict in co-founder relationships. Square that with the fact that most, co most, most companies fail because of uh, co-founder breakdowns. And there's just there's so many opportunities for things to fall apart. So what we did was we just got out in front of it all and we just made it a best practice. Like we're not in any kind of regular intense conflict. We just, uh, we just do it on a regular cadence like going to the dentist. It's just staying healthy for us. Uh, I, would, I would say as a proxy to co-founder therapy, you can also work with a co-founder coach. Um, and there, there are a lot of coaches who have clinical backgrounds and can, can work with dyads. This one seems odd. So back when I was a, back when I was a, a psychotherapist working with couples and families, you might think that most people who come into to marriage counseling are coming in because they have too much conflict. That's not true. Most people who come into marriage counseling are coming in because they do not know how to have conflict. And the result is all kinds of passive aggressive bullshit that they can't get their hands, they can't control. So it res the results in all this kind of weird, like bizarre symptomology in the relationship. The same thing happens with, with co-founders. Co-founders who do not know how to have conflict end up having a lot of passive aggressive, pass passive aggressive behaviors between them, and you start seeing things like like sabotage, sh like shit talking behind each other's backs. Um, uh, uh, um, mis like under communication, there's a tremendous amount of symptomology that happens as a result of people not knowing how to have hard conversations with each other. So you have to be able to have healthy conflict with your co-founder, bring that stuff out, out in the open, address it on a regular cadence. But not too much. Here's how to, ha here's the, here's how to not have too much conflict. Couple things. One is limit hyperbole. That you always, you nevers, eliminate that stuff. How about sometimes you don't respond to my emails for over a day and I'm left hanging. Sometimes uh, you can you raise your voice in meetings with with our, in, at me in front of my direct reports and it embarrasses me. So as soon as you say. You always raise your voice at me and embarrass me in front, in front of my direct reports. You put that person in this extreme box. So limit hyperbole. Another one is use iMessages. Hey, when you raise your voice at me in front of, our, in front of uh, my direct reports, I feel embarrassed. It's called an iMessage. 
When you do X behavior, I feel X emotion to my message. Address behavior rather than, uh, rather than addressing attitudes. Hey, sometimes when you come in late to a meeting, I feel like you don't maybe care. Versus, versus you come late to meetings because you have a bad attitude and you don't care about our company. Right? I'm making that that's like making an assumption about someone's attitude. Right? So don't try to make an assumption about what's going on in someone's inner world. Name the behavior. This will work with any co with any kind of conflict you have anywhere in your life. When this behavior happens, I feel this. Um, ask open-ended questions rather than accusatory questions. Hey, can you talk to me about you know, why you were late for this meeting? Right? That's an open question. How, how questions, what questions versus why questions. All right? The last one is the most important thing that you can learn how to do to not just maintain a healthy relationship with your co-founder, but a really healthy relationship with everyone in your company and, and your customers as well. Listen. Learn how to listen. I actually had to go and get a master's degree, in, and I, I, I grew up in a family system where everyone talked all over each other. Does anyone grow up in a family like that, where it's just like the dinner table is loud, and everyone's competing for airtime? So I grew up in a family like that. I, had to, I actually had to get a master's in learning how to listen. So it's true. So listening is important uh, in, in, order to, in order to be able to hear. People tend to listen just to react versus listening to really understand the other person. So listening will also help you with your, with your customers. Uh, have you ever heard someone say, uh, I was talking to this customer in this product interview and they're obviously just stupid or they just don't understand or they're not smart enough to get what we're doing. It happens all the time. It's like product 101. Listen to your customers. Take in what they're saying. Gen let their feedback affect you. So lastly, what I want to talk about is the effect of scale. As your company starts to scale, you'll go from your, your co-founder dyad, that period in the very beginning, maybe even before you've raised an, an angel round and all your friends are off at McKenzie and it's just you, the two of you, like hacking away on your keyboard thinking you were, you're nuts. You get through that period of time, you're gonna have a certain set of problems then. You're gonna solve those problems and then you're gonna have new problems. And your new problems come from scale. So scale is, scale in this case, it, it, the way I'm talking about it here is as your team grows. So what's going to happen is all of a sudden, all of your skill deficits and all of your leadership deficits are going to become hyper obvious, okay? So all of a sudden, you know, when I, when I had two, we didn't have that many people problems, but all of a sudden when we have 50, holy cow, now we've got all kinds of problems because, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm the co-founder that doesn't know how to deal with conflict and I just shy away from hard conversations. Those kind of co-founders, kind of co by the way, they tend to have a lot of low-performing company uh, employees that stick around in the company because they didn't want to give them hard feedback and they didn't want to fire them, right? So as your company grows, your skill deficits are also going to become very, very obvious, okay? I'm running sales and go to market. I've never been a VP of sales, okay? When you build out a sales organization, all of a sudden you're thinking about, okay, I've now got to, I've got to now do research. I've got to build a process. I've got to build up, a, I've, got to, I've got to figure out the quotas. I've got to hire the team. I've got to understand all of the particular roles of every single person on this team. I've not done that before. So all of a sudden, your skill deficits become very obvious. So as a, good co as a good founder, your job is to then recruit and backfill against your skill deficits. If you are a very egoish person and you have to be the smartest person in the room all the time, you're gonna suck at that. So the best thing to do is be very humble about your skills, be self-aware 
know where it is that you're strong, but know where it is that you're not strong well enough to be able to fill in, backfill against your deficits. And if, if those deficits happen to be in leadership, which is all the people aspect of what you're doing, then you, then you, then you need to get therapy, you need to get co-founder coaching, you need to work on your, you need to go to T groups, you need to work on your soft skills. So here are some takeaways from today. This is what we covered. Do you show the deck? Or can they show the deck? So they don't have to yes. like take it Okay. All right. Questions? <coughs> Let's start over here. Yeah. Is that me? Yes, you. Hey, thanks for doing it. It was very good. Um, in an earlier slide, you talked about, or you talked about the, um, the split of equity. Yeah. At what point of a startup would you have that discussion? So I feel like it's kind of weird having it too early because you don't really know at that point how much each person is going to or willing to put into the company. Yeah. My response is as early as you possibly can have that conversation. Again, my bias is toward my bias is towards uh, towards equal splits. If there's a really compelling reason why you can't do like you you need a, a world class astrophysicist in your company, and 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 you and in order to get this person, you have to give them a disproportionate amount of equity. Okay, right? But m my leaning is towards even splits. I mean, it better be a really compelling reason for why it is that you shouldn't have the same amount of equity. Because trust me, the problems that you're gonna have down the road is going to, that it's gonna cause, especially if the person with the lesser amount of equity turns out to be a big producer for the company, you're gonna have problems, big problems. So it has to be a very compelling reason to not have an equal split. Um, when did you decide that you wanted to do a startup and when is it necessarily too late to begin? You know, when we, I was in, I'm 45, and I was one of the older, oldest people at YC during my, in my batch. But there were people in our batch who were like, in their late 50s, man. Yeah, like even like their 60s. So, um, my answer, my response for that is, I, I, I've been a startup guy kind of my whole life. Um, I had a, a series of, a series of companies, and this was just a really exciting opportunity that I couldn't turn down, and I just had to do it. I had a very lucrative career as an executive coach, making like having a great impact, doing the thing I love to do, making more money than I ever thought I was going to make in this lifetime. And I left that career to take an 80% pay cut and start this company because of the mission, because of how excited I was. And what one was that? That was 2017, October to be exact. Um. What do you recommend someone to do like if you feel like their or if you feel like an idea is really good but the co-founder relationship might not work out but like you've already like started working on it? Oh, that's a good one. Um, again, it's so important who you choose and who you you have to work with that person. If it's not going to work, then the, then the earlier that you end that relationship, the easier. It gets hard. It, there's a there's a saying in the valley like hire slowly, fire quickly. So the earlier that you the earlier that you terminate that relationship, if you're pretty, if you're very clear it's not going to work, do it right away. Because as soon as you have people and infrastructure and there's money, like investors involved, like yeah. Do you feel like there's any like red flags where you like know for sure it won't work out? Well, I guess like, that's kind of hard to say, but... Uh, huge skill deficit differentials, um, uh, major personality issues, like t people who are um, either so conflict dependent, like highly conflicted people, like just like fighting all the time, everybody, or that person who just can't handle any conflict. They're just super timid and like can't handle a hard conversation. That person, not going to be a leader. Maybe they'll be a really great IC, an individual contributor, really brilliant, brilliant person, but they're not going to be able to manage people. There was a question over here. That was me. Um, how would you coach somebody through a breakup, like a co-founder breakup? I did a, did a lot, actually. 
Um, what would be some things through the breakup process. Yeah. Hopefully none of these people are going to get there because they're going to make great choices after this lecture <laughs> on how to choose their co-founder. Um, but get a facilitator um, and once, once get a facilitator before you're certain that it's, going to, that it's going to fall apart, okay? That's the first step. And then once you know that it's going to fall apart, if you have investors and there's already equity and you have an entity, it's probably more of a legal process than it is a therapeutic process. If you get it, if you catch it early enough, that's when it's a, more of a therapeutic or a coaching process. Later, it's a legal process. Yes, so I think this is actually the coaching idea is very interesting because it kind of gives me the sense that like, everybody with an executive coach, they can become a great founder. But is that actually true or like, is there some qualities that you're looking for in a great founder? We have three minutes left? Two minutes? How much time? Um, actually, we have half an hour. Oh, great. Awesome. This <laughs> <laughs> is rushing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, executive coaching is, is, going, to, is going to help you, uh, but it's a long term process. Okay? You're not going to take somebody who's highly conflict avoidant and then spit them out three months later after, after coaching, and that person is just like ready to rumble. That's, that, that's not, it's a long-term process because you're talking about addressing someone's like core feelings, feelings around vulnerability, understanding them in a very deep way, and then recommending behavioral changes, right? So it's a behavioral change process. Humans change behavior gradually over time. Um, when do you think uh, it's a good time to like sell your idea or sell your company versus just sticking with it and trying to develop it on your own? Say the question one more time, please. Um, when do you think is a good time to sell your company or sell your idea versus like developing that idea and sticking on, you know, that startup on your own? Okay. So if you go back, I had a slide earlier, and I think I actually um, uh, pretty, um, flew by this a little bit too fast. <laughs> Yes, I did fly that. It's too fast. So, in the beginning of your relationship, the one of the things that you want to assess there's when I was talking about symmetrical values and complementary skill sets. This is a very challenging one early on. Okay, so um, the way that the way to back into this answer is through looking at looking at the outcomes that you're looking for. Okay, so. You're going to need somebody in your company who's going to be more sales focused and who's going to raise money. Okay? Then you're going to need somebody in your company who's going to uh, build product. Then you're going to need, or design product. Then you're going to need somebody in your company who's going to uh, be the engineer that builds, builds that product, right? So think about the ultimate outcomes that you want to go for. And then you have to look at skills and personality types. And make, you're going to make some concessions and figure out who's going to fit into those buckets. So your CEO, is that person has to be able to raise money. That person has got to be able to have the chops and be insane enough to drive down to Sand Hill Road and stand up in front of big meetings of people who all went to Harvard Business School and are just going to pepper them with analytical questions about their company who are most likely not going to invest in them. And then that person has to stand up the next day after getting rejected and do it all over again with the same enthusiasm. That's your CEO. Then the person who's got the ability to hire out an engineering team and is, gonna, is going to be that kind of rainmaker engineer who's going to recruit in the most like, competitive recruiting market in the history of the world for engineers, that person needs to be your CTO. That's not necessarily your best engineer. And then the person who's like your design thinker, that person should probably be your head of product. So what I, when I'm, the way that I answer the question is think about the outcomes that you're looking for and then agree on titles. Um, it's hard. Some people, some people botch this and end up being co-CEOs. I don't recommend that because they, you, you'll see that it, there's been a there's a couple of cases where that works, 
Um, but the, the truth is, is when, it, when reporters and when investors reach out, they want to talk to the CTO and they want that to be one person. Right? Can I throw a quick you and then, up? Oh, yeah. sure, okay. So, because I, I, I'm in this situation and we've kind of been pushing this talk away because we're all kind of afraid that once there's a certain CEO, a certain hierarchy will be kind of within the team. Yep. Do you, is, is that... That is, is a thing. It, that's a thing. Oh yeah, man. That is real. And how do you tackle this, this hierarchy almost? Yeah, because... That's totally there. So, as soon as you decide who's the CEO, all of a sudden that, that hierarchy stuff happens and there's power dynamics. And what bridges the gap between, uh, between power dynamics is trust. So, whoever is not the CEO needs to really trust that other person. Okay? So, you bridge the gap in power dynamics with very, very healthy pra relationship practices and trust building. Again, in my case, I chose very carefully, and he chose very carefully. We had been through a two-year psych program together. He knew all of my deep, dark secrets and vice versa. And we knew how each other would behave when, when the going gets tough. That's the other thing about choosing your co-founder. Know how that person behaves when things get really shitty. Because things are going to be really shitty a lot. And you need to know how that person acts and behaves when things are terrible, when you're running out of money, when you don't, when every investor you talk to is 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 not is not saying yes, when your customers aren't buying, when your customers buy and then quit, they churn. That happens. So know how that person is going to behave in those circumstances. Is are they going to start attacking and blaming? And if you if that person is a, an attack and blamer, do not hire that person to be your co-founder. So trust, that's my answer to that, because it will happen. And the, the power dynamics are unavoidable. Um, how do you feel like your background in psychology affects your working relationships? Because like, I'm also studying psych in business, and sometimes I feel like that causes me to like, over-psychoanalyze things and like, take things out of proportion. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Because we both had long-term, uh, I had an eight-year clinical practice and Keegan had it about the same, we kind of got tired of overanalyzing. Believe it or not, there's like an exhaustion point, especially like when you're in grad school, you want to analyze everybody and everything, and then after a while, you get anal analysis fatigue and you kind of stop. Um, so we don't really do that that much. The way that it helps us is that it, 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 we're just very alert on the best practices and we don't shy away from the hard conflicts. We have the tools to have, have healthy conflict regularly. And I, what I mean by healthy conflict, I mean by like light sort of medium arguments where maybe voices kind of get raised, but we never name call, ever. We never, we don't criticize each other's character. We don't attack each other. We, neither of us ever threatens divorce. I mean, that's another cardinal rule is like, don't ever threaten, drop the D word, right? So we have all these best practices in, our, in these toolkits because of our psych backgrounds. And we both, like, like our co-founder, our, our skills were forged in the fiery swamps of marital couples and divorce. So we've seen really nasty stuff. And we brought that to bear. And I think it's a huge asset. It's a big, big asset that you have. Um, I guess, how big of a role does, does like friendship go into being a necessary part of being a co-founder? Yeah. And then um, also, is, have you seen any issues with like having a male, female, platonic co-founders? I think gender diversity is a huge plus if you can achieve that. Um, I think absolutely uh, do it, and it's 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 just great for all kinds of reasons having that gender diversity and just diversity in general on your founding team. Um, so I definitely lean towards the positive. It's going to help you with recruiting. Um, and then the question around um, around your uh, it was around friendship. Yeah, just like that friendship aspect. Of yeah. 
So it's interesting. We are, uh, we're extremely close. Like there's, there's really, I mean, he knows what's going on in my marriage. He knows what's going on with my kids. Like if I have a kid that's sick, he knows about it. Vice versa. I know what's going on in his marriage. I know it's like stuff with him and his wife, etc. Right? Yet, it's not like we don't treat our relationship like we have the closeness that I have of a very, very uh, strong friendship that I've had for years, but we boundary it. I don't hang out with my co-founder on the weekends. I, I don't. Um, I, we don't go to shows together at night. I don't actually go to shows anymore. I have two toddlers, but um, but that we 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 don't uh, we don't plan vacations together. We let each other have our own kind of private lives outside of our relationship because when we're we're so intensely close every day at work and it's so intimate that we kind of just let each other kind of have their kind of other our private lives. So it's a very unique relationship, different like than any other that you'll have. It's like that incredible closeness that you have with the best friend with these very, very strong kind of compartmentalized like uh, boundaries. Um, earlier you said like something about selling your second company. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering when you sold your first company and like how did you develop that company? So my first company straight out of undergrad failed miserably after about three years, went up in flames. Uh, I went through a serious depression for about a year, then founded my second company and recapitalized. That company did actually quite well. And then I sold it. Um, sorry, your question was, why did you sell? No, or, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Why, why did you sell the second company? I sold that second company because, well, we were selling shoes worldwide, okay? And we bootstrapped the company. We did not. We did not uh, have any outside capital. And when Zappos, we had a huge competitor. So we had a big market change. Okay, Zappos came into the market, and all of a sudden was selling the same shoes as us for a lower price. And that's how I le learned what venture capital was. Honestly, I was like, we're paying the same price for these shoes but they're selling them for less than us and they're giving their customers free shipping. That's how I learned about venture capital. So our sales started to kind of flatten out. And at that point, um, it had been eight years. I was tired, man. I was exhausted and I was ready to do something else. And we had an opportunity to sell the company because it was, it was still very profitable. But our, our, our growth trajectory uh, fell off. So what um, would you say you had like a lot of like skill or background knowledge in building a company when you started the second one? It's really the third one. It's really Torch, uh, building this venture-backed platform for executive coaching. It's a B2B leadership coaching uh, company. I've had a lot of business experience before going into this third company. Going into my second company, I had you know three years of experience out of undergrad. The first, just not. I was 21, man. I knew nothing. I was like, I had the skills I came out of out of undergrad, and that is, and and the truth is, I would still do it again today. I've never I've never worked for anybody else. That's my own. I, all I've done has been a serial founder, and I'm so happy that I took that route. So I, if you're going to start a company straight out of undergrad, thumbs up, do it. Because you know what? A lot of people start their companies right out of undergrad, and it works. It didn't work for me, but it might work for you. I'll come back. So, let's say, for example, you get Series A funding. Can you talk a little louder? So, let's say, for example, you get Series A funding. Yeah. $10 million. Yes. And uh, your company fails. Yes. What happens to the people who invest in the company? They lose their money. <laughs> and so quick to this, you know, with what you're doing in terms of just Yeah. Is it just like the money just goes? Nothing happens to, to the founders? I mean how that what happens when, when companies fail? Yeah. They fail because um, 
So you're saying, like, say after after you raise your A, you've got your 10 million, and then now you've got to get to your Series B, or become or become EBITDA positive, or die, right? So those are the possible outcomes. And so you, when you raise your A, you're going to all of a sudden take on an investor onto your board, and that person is going to want you to spend that money. They're going to want you to spend that money very fast. They're going to want you to shove that money into recruiting and hiring engineers and hiring scientists and hiring marketing people and salespeople. Okay? They're going to want you to accelerate because they would rather push you to that point that you accelerate so fast and just go out of business because they would rather lose 1x of their money than having a company that limps around for 20 years that never gives them an outcome. So what they'd rather do is accelerate you off of a cliff or accelerate you into the stratosphere. That's what they're looking for. So that's where the money goes. It goes into payroll. And then they lose their money. But investors would much rather lose 1x, 1x of their money quickly and then move on to find the next Uber. Do you recommend to have the co-founder that only have financial profits less than you would just bring $10 million when you just start up? Do you recommend to have those kind of co-founders? Sorry, sorry, say that. So it's like, let's say you have a co-founder that only gives you money for startup, and it takes like about 50% of the equity. Equity? Yeah. But so they're not an operator? Not, yeah. They're not doing anything, but just giving them money for you to start up. Do you recommend uh, that? Uh, no. Uh, because um, you're going to have to, then you have 50% of the company, okay? You have no no employees, okay? How much money is it, first of all? If that, is that person going to, what valuation? Okay, so there's a, there's, this is a valuation question. That, is that person is going to give you a, a lar large amount of money at a great valuation, then great. Then you have enough cash to then go and hire a bunch of people, yeah. okay? Yeah. But the problem with your scenario is that is that is is, is an equity issue. All right, you're then going to have half of the half of the company, probably a small amount. You've probably now sold half of your company for what a million dollars? I don't know what two million, four million. I've now sold half of my company at an incredibly low valuation. Okay, now I've got to build a company all the way to IPO or some $500 million exit with half of the pie. So you want to you're, you want to raise as little money in the beginning as possible. That's why it's better to have a co-founder who's just like some amazing engineer, or like great with sales, or going to be great with PR, right? Raise $300,000, right, on your $2 million valuation, get a little farther, then raise a million dollars on a 12 cap, right? Then, you know, get to, you know, 300000 in monthly recurring revenue, and then raise your $10 million, right? Then, then you've dil diluted your company over time and at the right valuations that you can then hi hire world-class talent. Those, those really talented people are going to cost you a lot of equity. So, when you have this Series A funding and you're getting pushed either off the cliff or off the table, does the investor use his clout and influence to help you with the process of the takeoff? <laughs> it depends on the investor. <laughs> so most most of them want to make a huge return on their money, right? Most of them are looking for the next Uber or the next Facebook um, or you know the next Google, right? And so they're going to use their clout. They're going to use their clout to help you uh, accelerate into the stratosphere, right? But if they, if they, if you, you look like a company that's failing, that's just sort of limping along, they call them zombies, right? Then usually what they do is they don't necessarily just like, there are cases if they just really don't like you and there are vicious people out in the world who will just try to kill you. And, and that happens. There are a lot of cases where like investors will actively 
bury a founder. That's not the common one. More usually, what they do is they will replace themselves with a, 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 a like an associate from the and put that person in the board seat, and then they'll just leave. They'll just disengage. <coughs> so in their board seat, they'll put like a, a low-level like associate. And then they'll just never talk to you again. All of a sudden, they're not returning your iMessages anymore. Just a follow-up question, please. So, you have crushed as a founder. In a good way? In a bad way. But oh, a bad way. Oh, you've crashed. Yes. OK. Do you ever deal with founders who are at that stage mentally? Do All the time, yeah. Tons. It's very depressing. It's painful as hell. It hurts really bad. But you know what? The cool thing about Silicon Valley and the cool thing about uh, about the U.S. is that there is a culture here that's much more forgiving of failure. For example, in Europe, one of the reasons why there's not as much innovation, startup innovation in Europe, is because it's really bad to fail in Europe. Right? Culturally speaking, in the U.S., like. Failure is okay. If you're if you're a good founder and you fail a couple times, investors will keep backing you. If you fail after your Series A, but you showed good leadership, you show that you're a good person, you built a pretty cool product, but there was some reason why your company failed, the investor uh, might back you again. It happens all the time. I see founders who lose everything. The, the same exact investor who invested them in their failed startup will come and back them for their next startup. Unless you're a jerk, right? If, if you don't treat people well, and if you like are one of those founders that is like, you know, like a Me Too founder, like those people will be like never invested in again. So, so it is really important that as you're running your company that you that you conduct yourself with very strong ethics and, and, and good behavior. Um, what made you want to go to grad school and how do you think, or like why, why didn't you just want to like done it and just keep doing start? I, 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 for me it was like, it was a personal mission to go and do my psych degree. It wasn't really about business at all. It was about personal development. I, I didn't go to a school that was at all fancy for my graduate degree. It was, I went there because it had the best reputation for the experience of, of personal development. It had a very well good reputation for, for self personal development, right? So for me, it was just like a pivot into something totally different that I needed to do. Um, but there are a lot of people who chose choose to go to B school, right? So you might choose to you might choose to go to B school. It may or may not help you as a founder. The, the networks and the affiliations are really great. There's a lot of great founders who didn't go to B school, and there's a lot of ones that did. So that's a hard one. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, healthy conflicts. Uh, so that's, yeah. that's, that's a good point. Uh, meanwhile, I think uh, sometimes uh, it's going to be some hard time for for you and your co-founders to have different uh, opinions. Guaranteed. Uh, but, uh, yeah. but given that the time is limited, the capital is limited. So maybe you have to make a decision whether to, whether to go south or go to north. So, so for, for, for that situation, what's, what's the best practice for you to uh, convince the others? Yeah. So you're kind of between, between your co-founders of your kind of negotiation, you're stuck on a point. So for us, again, like we talk, we meet every single day. We have a, we have a daily meeting Monday through Friday, every single morning we start out. And we just clear the air. Is there anything going on? So that's like, what's, what happened last week? What's going to happen this week? And then how are we, right? Is there anything in between us that happened last week that we need to unpack? Uh, so we don't really get to gridlock conflict very often because we've, we're proactively addressing those little micro conflicts every day. So there's never really that buildup, right? Um, as if we're not in agreement on, a, on, on something, it doesn't really, we are so aligned that it's very rare. He and I are almost always like thinking the same thing. And, but in, in cases where we're not aligned, you know, we kind of go with like whoever might be real, the most passionate about that. And like he might be like, I really think we got to do this thing. I really think we got to hire that person. And I'm like, 
hmm, okay, well, you're really passionate about it, go for it. That decision, then he has to own that, right? If that decision turns out to be a failed decision, then he's got to own and be, be accountable for that. But we don't tend to do this about it. It's sort of like we kind of trust each other so much, and whoever's the most passionate about it will sort of go with that person's opinion. Once, if it gets really bad, though, um, like there, and, and you can't, then you would hire a facilitator. You might talk a little bit about your vision at the porch. Sure. Like, yeah. Yes. I'm happy to do that. How much time do I have? Um, I think like uh, five to ten. Minutes. Okay, five to ten minutes. Yes. So please stay in touch with us um, on Twitter, and feel free to ask us any questions or engage with, engage with us over social or in our webinars, we have, which we have frequently. So what Torch is, is so I was in business, in the business world, and I was in the psych world. I brought those two things together to become an executive coach. I saw how, how much demand there was at, in, at, inside of corporations for what we were doing, and I thought, hey, I'm going to create this digital marketplace such that companies who need leadership coaching for slews of employees can then come and engage with their coaches, get paired with their coaches, and then um, assess, uh, measure, and manage the best practices of the development of their employees. So that's essentially what Torch is. We're a, we're a B2B company that's kind of like a SaaS, it's, it's a SaaS business with a digital software platform, and then a marketplace of leadership coaches that allow what, uh, that the employees can then engage with. So what mine is, is a combination of a, of a, of a software business and a services business together. And it's, it's, it's unique to who I am. It, came, it comes from my background in psych and business. So that's the vision of it. The idea of what we're trying to create, the outcome for the company, is that what we're trying to do is create a different kind of uh, leader in the world. I, I'm a big believer in the rise of populism all over the world, that it's really, really time to create a, a different framework for what it means to be a leader in this world. And so we're coming in with a point of view and a vision about what it is to be a great leader. For us, that's a combination of high performance and empathy. When you bring high performance and empathy together, you get powerful leadership. A leader who's only high performance and without empathy, there's a lot of companies that, that have those types of leaders. They might do well for a while, but what happens is, as soon as that company starts to fall, like they're, they, they're, they stop executing on a strategic level, they have a ton of churn. Because if you have a leader that's high performance and doesn't care about their employees, those employees are only going to stick around as long as the company is crushing it, right? Similarly, if you have a leader who is just highly empathic and that person you always want to be around, that, that leader that you really love and always want to be liked by and always likes you, if, 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 that, if, that, if that leader doesn't also have the ability to hold to to fire people, to put people on performance plans, to set up objectives and data that you need and targets that you need to hit. You have a company that might well, the employees will stick around because it's a loving place to work, but that company doesn't hit targets. That company isn't able to raise money because it's just a loving place to work, but it's not a high performance culture. So what we're trying to create at Torch is this upper right quadrant where you've got a healthy, em empathetic culture, and then you've also got very strong structures that drive performance. That's the leadership um, holy grail that we're after. And we're building software and a marketplace of coaches to help people do that. Yes. So I'll uh, put you on the spot a little bit. How much does it cost? To what? For your services, for example. Yeah. You come into a company, 
maybe 15 employees, yep. and you're trying to work with the executive team, yep. and uh, the duration and stuff like this are worth it now. So it's not going to cost you anything unless uh, unless you're the uh, the founder of the company. If you're if you're paying for it as a company, what you're going to pay our company is you're going to pay a minimum of five hundred dollars a month for that seat. Okay, so a seat gets you access to the software and it gets you a coach. Now, if you want to put if you want to hire if you want to buy ten seats or a hundred seats, you've got to pay five hundred times 100, and that's what you have to pay Torch every month, right? So that's how our company gets very big. It, it gets big on re, based on recurring revenue. People are coming back to use the access to data and to use the software and to engage with their coach every month. So through recurring revenue, that's how we build up to the, this big, these kind of big um, ARR targets that we have to hit in order to raise future rounds of funding. Uh, what do you think has been the biggest challenge in just um, starting to work or like working on a The biggest challenge for me was that early stage when I thought I was going nuts because I just left a really lucrative career and took a huge pay cut, turned on a ton of opportunity in order to start the company. That was the hardest part, raising that, that first stage. Do you always recommend that to people who... It takes a certain kind of person it really does. You have to be able to be the person who can sit in the midst of an uncertainty and not knowing the answer and to be comfortable that you're going to find a way to get there. That's the other thing is you're not going to have all the skills that you need to make a company successful. So you're building something. You're building a, a plane to get to like this, this other planet and you don't have the skills to build that plane. All you have to have it right now is the skills to build this tiny little part of it. You have to be willing to start on that tiny little part and have the trust that you're going to be able to build the rest of the machine. So I don't recommend it to everybody. So maybe the last question. Anybody has another question? Actually, I have a more question regarding the coach. So how does the um, software and technology part factor into your business? Because coaching is a very personal kind of thing. It measures it through people analytics. So the, we have a matching algorithm that matches the people and, and with the coach, the client and the coach. Right? So that match is very, very important. So we have essentially like a psychological test that, that matches two people together. And then once you come onto the platform, we have to find out who you are in order to help you and find out what your skills gaps are and your leadership gaps. So we essentially give you a much bigger psychological test and we ask all of your colleagues to give us information about you. That's called a 360 review. So then we juxtapose, we juxtapose your self-report with what all of your colleagues said about you and then we can find the, we find the gaps. This is what Cameron thinks about himself, but this is what everybody's really saying about me. That gap is the gap in which we have to work with, right? So the, the coach comes in to help me with that gap, and then the rest of the software component is building a, com a developmental plan that allows me to close that gap. So the software is there for the assessment, and then also for the developmental plan. And then lastly, the HR department has to have a dashboard to log into to, man to, to, to see how all of their employees are doing. So that's how the software, the software is what Create, manage the best practices and allows for the scale of the services to happen all over the world. All right. Thanks so much. And give some thank you, Matthew. Oh, thank you. Thanks, yeah. everybody. This was really fun.